seven doctrines that separate the Christian church from the religions of the world. As a great missionary of missionaries, Paul had learned this firsthand. It's not something he read out of a book, didn't learn it from some seminary teacher. He actually learned it from boots on the ground. He writes back to the Ephesians about it, about the importance of seven doctrines of the Christian church uh, in uh, fighting world religions in, in a culture. In verse 4, 5, and 6, he lists them, one body, one spirit, called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. We have looked at the one body. We have looked at the one spirit. Today we look at the hope of the hope of the one hope of calling. And we'll probably do a, two or three studies in this group. Um, I think probably people don't have a good understanding of a calling. And uh, so we're going to try to clear that up. Uh, this will be my introductory study on it uh, today. Uh, so we are looking at this. We're taking each one of these and trying to get a good understanding of it. Uh, we live in a, a wonderful nation where the church has always had great respect. Not just because they're very charitable, which they are, but they always had a firm, solid belief system that other people could attach to. Absolutes. And that's really important for the church to have absolutes because we live in a world of relativity. And absolutes is what gives you some stability in a, a world of whirlwinds in your life. And so he says here are seven key doctrines for sure. And when you look at the word calling, it's kind of interesting because this word is all over the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, very strongly in the Old Testament. Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. It's a very strong word in the Old Testament, and people do a lot of study on it. And it's a very popular word used a lot in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when they use the word call, um, and it has a lot of variation of, re of, of ideas. It has a central idea with it, but, you know, I just received a call from somebody. Uh, I called my dog home. There are a lot of ways that this word call is used. And we're, the Hebrews, they use the word kara. When you're dealing with God, the word kara, trying to take it out of a cultural way of using the word call, like I got a call on my phone or I called my children the other day or whatever. Um, to bring it into a theological place, when you use the word kara, that's the Hebrew word kara for the word calling, it carries the idea of the content or the message and expects a response, RSVP. And it expects. And we get those kind of things in the mail, don't we, to showers and weddings and things of that nature, things that are very important to people who are planning that RSVP is very important, isn't it? I mean, how many people are we going to cook for and how many people are we going to have to seat and that type of thing. And so it, it places, 
you realize that when the people give you that kind of invitation with that RSVP, then out of good respect, you respond, I'm, yes, I'm coming, no, I'm not. But you don't treat it like a file 13. Would you agree with that? You don't do it like the typical junk mail. You see what it is and you throw it in the trash. Uh, that would be disrespectful to somebody who thought you were important to the family or to somebody to send you this special invitation. Agreed? That's the way the Hebrew uses this word. What is interesting about the Greeks, the Greeks use the same thing, but kaleo adds intent. The intent. The intent. And so it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting while one emphasizes the content of the message and the people considered you special, they sent you with an RSVP. The, the Greek word emphasizes the RSVP all right and responds to it with intent. The intent. We, we expect a response. If you're not able to come, if you, a courtesy would say no, we're not going to be able to come. Yes, we're able to come. But it would be disrespectful to throw it in the trash like a file 13, what we, we used to call file 13, trash can. And so the Greeks carry the same idea of the Hebrew, but place emphasis on the response. Yes, no, but not indifference. Shows a lack of respect. And so that's the understanding of this word calling. The calling comes from God as a RSVP, whatever it is, whatever his will is, salvation, whatever it is, walking in the spirit, walking by faith, whatever it is, there's a calling associated with it. And God responds to the yes, the no. The response is very important to him. Indifference. Indifference. Apathy falls under a whole different category. And over the next couple of times that I meet with you on this subject matter, we're going to show you that. Jesus did parables on it. we we'll give you a good look at that. But today what I'm going to do is we're going to look at the one hope of calling and deal with it in general terms. And when we get to our couple next lessons, I'm going to deal with it more showing you from the divine side to the human side of how the RSVP is respected or not and how God deals with it. Point number one, let, let me have a word of prayer with you. Let me have a word of prayer. Okay. I, Al covered it well, but uh, for no other reason I need it. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It's to be learned and lived in spirituality and not carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sin. You can't study the Bible. You can't live it apart from spirituality. That is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, especially in Bible study where he says he will teach and recall. That's vitally important to the Christian life, both in and the assimilation of growth, spiritual growth as well as ministry. So I give you a moment, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, how thankful we are for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls today, not distract us from the truth, not distract us from the message, and what will our response be when it is sent RSVP? 
will be in appliance with it? Will we rebel against it? Will we throw it in file 13? What we do with this lesson, Father, is as important as anything because it's part of a calling. For the Christian, it's part of his spiritual growth momentum. For the unbeliever, it's his invitation to come by grace into the salvation of God because Christ died on that cross for our sins, was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead to give us life everlasting. Those who believe it, receive it. Those who don't, have a, have a period of time of grace because God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So I pray, Father, for those. Today is the day of salvation. Believe the gospel of Christ and be saved. And let the next hour be fruitful in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first point, I just want to deal with Ford today. God's invitational call. Call always is invitational. God's invitational call to grace salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ is extended to all mankind. If you have a pencil with you, circle the word all mankind. Because you're not going to believe this, but that's, a, that's hugely debated in the Christian church. And it should not be. The Christian church is divided in two camps on this subject of atonement. One is unlimited atonement, and one is limited atonement. I'm going to show you passage after passage, and I could spend all my time on point one by specific words that God uses that he believes in unlimited atonement. Let me show you some. For example, John 1.21, most of you know that. I didn't write it out. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to save the sins of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God that's come to be a provision for the sins of the world, the blood. He didn't say some in the world. He just used a bold statement, the world. That helps us divide two camps in the world. There is the world of the unsaved, and there is the world of the saved. Christ came into the world to save the whole world, not just to some of it, not just to a, a specific continent or a specific community. He came to save the whole world. There's another verse, John 3, 16, that everybody knows that says that he sent his, son, sent his son into the world to save the world. That those of the world that are perishing would no longer perish but have eternal life. In 1 Peter 1, 18 uh, through uh, 25, in verse 18, he talks about the redeemed out of the world. You're redeemed out of the world of uh, the unbeliever. Redeemed out of the world by the blood. And listen, he calls it the precious blood of the lamb. Unblemished and without spot. No birth defects, no growth defects. It was the impeccable lamb of God that came to save the world from their sin. There are words like the world. <laughs> Sometimes the word will talk about those who are in the world. For example, the sinner. 1 Timothy 1.15, not on your paper, but in 1 Timothy 1.15 it says that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I was chief. And Paul was a religious leader. Of the Jewish faith. And wasn't saved. And Paul talks about that. He said, I, I felt that I was the chief of the sinners because I was religiously lost of the Jewish faith. Then there are other passages like this one, 1 John 2.2. 2. I'm just not cherry-picking this stuff. I'm just picking out 
a lot of passages that deal with my subject. I didn't give you all of them either. I don't need but one to tell me that, and it satisfies me, but I got a lot of them. He himself or alone. He himself or he's the only one. He himself is the propitiation. It takes the judgment to appease the wrath of God. The propitiation for our sins. Watch this now. And not only, and not ours only, but also for those, watch this now, of the whole world. Now, how plainer, listen, you don't need any more verse than that, right? That's as clear as it gets. You know, people say, like, the nose on your face. Well, that's clear. We call that unlimited atonement. It means it's only limited by volition. You can either accept, accept it or reject it. Here's another one, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all. But for all to come to repentance, that's metanoia, or change your mind that Christ is the only way to God, John 14, 6. No man can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life to God. Not, not wishing for any, not wishing for any to perish, but for all. Here's one, Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Look what's appeared. Look what appeared. Grace appeared. That's a historical idea. Bringing salvation to all men. Mankind. Galatians 1, 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. A different gospel would change the idea. Here's the true gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Anything less than that is a different gospel. Here's another part of that gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe, Romans 1.16. Anything other than that is not the gospel. It's not by works. It's not anything you do. You're, you're Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. Works is not a gift, Romans 4, 4. Works is a wage. You've earned it. You don't earn salvation. It's a gift. Grace appeared. It's an interesting way for Paul to say that. And so we've explained the grace gospel out of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is a staggering idea in theology, Hebrews 2.9. Listen to what he says. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. That's the humanity of Christ that's going to go to the cross and die for us. Look how it's described. This is the only begotten son of God, hypostatic man, that's just been described to you. Namely, Jesus. Why did he use Jesus? The name Jesus means that he's came to save his people from their sin. We'll call his name Jesus, Matthew 121. Because, you ought to circle that, because 
He was made a little, the only begotten Son of God, second member of the Trinity, Godhead, was made lower than angels in the creative order. This man, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, buried our sins on his body, 1 Peter uh, 2.24. Crowned with glory and honor, having completed his mission. Listen, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for how many? How many? Don't let anybody tell you some. Everyone means everyone. Don't mean some, it means everyone. Now, whether everyone accepts it or not, that's a whole different ballgame. They have volition. We're in the angelic conflict. You see, I am telling you today that the church of Jesus Christ is divided in the world whether they tell you it or not. I am bold about what I believe. I lay it out on the front table. I don't hide anything. I don't have any secret beliefs that I don't tell you. I don't hide things under the table. And then after you join, you go like, whoa, I never knew you believed that. I'll tell you why, too. Because I have to be accountable to God Almighty. I'm not accountable to you as a congregation, except in a secondary way. I'm held accountable in my words and conduct every day of my life. I'm held accountable. And that's fine with me. I, underst I understood that's what the call to be a minister was all about. I knew that. God was very clear with me, and I try, I try to be very clear with the young men in here that are in ministry about this. You're accountable to God Almighty. This is a high calling, a high calling. And he expects more from you than anybody else. Because you represent the work and ministry of Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean that you're out on any less responsibility as a congregation. I'm just telling you where I am. Don't hide nothing. I'm an open book. My faith is right out there. And if you come and ask me personal questions about my faith, I'll be glad to share it with you and document it. This is what I believe. I study to believe it. I live it. I don't study to teach it. I study it to live it and then teach it. I'm just telling you. I think that's the way this whole thing is supposed to work. And not just for me. I just have a gift. But it's a gifted ministry. But listen, you have a gifted ministry no less than mine. Every person in here that's a believer have a spiritual gifted ministry. It's really important. And you, you are by the same scale of value of integrity that I am. <clears throat> Here's the second point. Now, what was the first point? Listen, Christ died. He, the, call of, the invitational call to salvation that comes from God through Christ is for every human person in the world. And I don't go around evangelize dogs or cats. But I do people. Because I believe that's what Christ died on the cross for. In the title, the world. Here's point number two. A faith response. What kind of RSP, RS, RSVP is he looking for? 
He's looking for a faith response. For by grace are you saved by faith. For by grace you're saved by faith. So what is the response he's looking for? If grace has appeared to all men, and it has, what, what response, what RSVP is he looking for? What is the response that God is looking for him, sending his son, i.e. the gospel? What's he looking for? He's looking for faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace saves you through faith. Faith in what? For salvation, faith is in the gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Your faith has to be in that. Only, only way you can be saved. It's the only way grace works. It doesn't work by you adding to grace. You can't, either Christ does all the work or he does none of it. Because you're saved by grace, which is 100% God and zero man. Because it's based on 100% of the death of Christ, the burial and resurrection. You have to accept that by faith. And you're saved 100% by God called grace. And it's based on your faith in the work of Christ. The gospel. Somebody's got to be listening to me today. Maybe in Taiwan, if not here. A faith respond, response to the invitational God's call to grace salvation results in every believer, person who believes, being rescued from the domain of darkness and being transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. There you are, Colossians 1.13 at the bottom of your paper. Here's what I want you to do on the bottom of your paper. What, look up here. In the, in, right in the middle, I want you to put the cross, the burial, and the resurrection sign. That's the gospel. Christ died for your sins, buried, and raised from the dead. That's the gospel. On each side of that symbol, I want you to draw a circle. When you look down at that piece of paper... The circle on the left, put Adam, and on the circle on the right, put Christ. On the circle on the left, put world. On the circle on the right, put kingdom of the beloved son. Kingdom of the beloved son. You can abbreviate it if you know what it is. Now, here's what Colossians 1.13 says on the bottom of your paper. Watch this now. He who rescued us from the domain of darkness. Over on the left side, write the word darkness. Now, take your pencil and from the cross, do a loop over to the circle on the left. Take a loop over. Just, you know... Look up here. Just loop it over there to it. Start, start at the cross and just loop a line over, you know, loop a line over to the circle where it's got Adam, world, darkness. On that line somewhere, write the word rescued. Write the word rescued. The moment you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, at that very moment, you are rescued by the grace of God. You are rescued. You were in bondage to that circle on the left. You were in bondage. There was no way you could get out of it on your own. None. You were rescued. You were a POW and you got rescued from POW status, got rescued. That's grace. Somebody was sent in to rescue you. An elite was sent in and rescued. That is Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Now watch. When you are rescued, watch this now, draw, draw a, a, a lot over from the cross to the circle on the right. 
do the same thing, but on the right. Loop one from the cross, loop it over to the circle on the right, and write the word transferred, transferred. What a wonderful Bible lesson that is. The moment you believe that Christ died for you, was buried and raised from the dead, on the one hand, immediately, immediately you are rescued from POW status of the world of your sin, of darkness, satanic darkness, and you are transferred by the grace. That's rescued by grace and transferred by grace at the same time into the kingdom of the beloved son. Now, here's what I want you to do. The circle on the left, did you, did you, did you loop them? Did you loop from the cross to the, to the left and to the right? If you didn't loop it, forget it. Because you're not paying attention. If you looped it, if you looped it, then the circle on the, on the left, draw a line through it. Just draw a line through it. Like, you know, where you see in size that says no smoking in there. Dry, <laughs> I put a line through it. No smoking. Just put a line through it. Because the moment you were rescued and transferred, you were no longer part of that left circle. No more. Kaput. Gone. That side's where your 13 judicial charge of Adamic sin is. You're no longer part of the world. You're part of the kingdom of Christ. You're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. The 20 status privilege and that transfer 20 status privileges. That whole package of 50 things you receive at salvation is right there on that paper right there. 13 on the left, a line through it, and the rest of them on the, on the right. On the left is gone. Gone. You know what that is? That's grace. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It was done by the work of Christ on the cross, and it's done. Let the devil tell you anything else. Also, you can read this in, in Acts 26, 18, and write this down. 1 Peter 2, 9. Oh, wait, I wrote it down. It's on the back of your page. Oh, I spoil you people. Watch this now. I'm going to... I want you to write one, two, three, four. When I tell you to write one, well, I want you to write above a word. Are you with me? Well, the good thing is nobody's gone to sleep yet. Thank you. Watch this. You are now one, a chosen race. If you've been transferred, if you've been transferred, here's who you are. You are a chosen race. Number two, a royal priesthood. Number three, a holy nation. Number four, a people of God's own possession. Now pay attention. You are now a chosen race. You are now a royal priesthood. You are now a holy nation. I'm talking about those who have been transferred into the kingdom of Christ. In the kingdom of Christ, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Listen to me now. And God's own possession. You are, you are the people of God, God's own possession. Write down above that, God's own possession. Write down John 10, 28 through 30. If you have been transferred into the kingdom, this is who you are in the kingdom you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. God's own possession. You got these four titles, status privileges. You got these status privilege titles when you were transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. This is who you are in the kingdom of the beloved son. And you got it because you were transferred by the grace of God. Here's point number three. Every church age believer 
receives the same one hope of calling in the package of grace salvation, everyone receives it at the same time. When you believe the gospel of Christ, you receive the one hope of calling. The word hope means confident expectation. Elpis. Elpis is in the room. Elpis is in the house. Where's Ed when I need him? One hope of your calling. Do you have that hope? Do you have that hope that when you believe the gospel of Christ, you were rescued and was transferred, and this who you are, and the transfer, this is who you are. You have been, you, you have, everybody in this room that believes the gospel has one hope of calling, one confident expectation that I've been called of God, and I've responded in a positive way, and I am his forever. From that point, I'm his forever. God's own possession. Did you get that? That's eternal security. God's own possession. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 1, 13, 14. Listen to how Paul explains it. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved. The word brethren and beloved are... Status privileges, 20 status privileges that in that little, ha that little pamphlet, 50 things. That's the status privilege. You know, what that, you know how you become a brethren and a beloved? Because you got transferred. If you're in the kingdom, that's who you are in the kingdom. That's who you are in the kingdom of the beloved son. You're, you're part of the, you're brothers because you have the same father. One God and father of us all. We're brethren. We're the beloved because in Christ, we are the beloved of God. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you. Chosen you is another status privilege of being transferred. You were chosen from the beginning, Ephesians 1.14, in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. For salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit, faith and truth. It was for this. Watch out now. It was for this. He called one of the status privileges. It was for this. He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're in his kingdom. You're in the kingdom of the beloved son. Look at the, turn your paper over for a moment. I guess when you flip the paper, it just flips your mind. He rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. One of them is, you are now the beloved of God in the beloved son. And these never change. You get them because you're transferred. You're part of the family of God. You will always be part of the family of God, even if you're a prodigal. You're still part of the family. You're the beloved in Christ, not in yourself, in him. And you always have this. The idea is this is who you are. Be, get, be comfortable in your own skin with who you are in Christ and live it out of you. You're the beloved. You're the beloved. You're the brethren. You're the chosen. You're the called. Watch this. 1 John 3, 1. Watch this now. I'm going to give you another status, who you are, because you've been transferred into the kingdom. See, see, see. See 
how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. You know why you can love yourself more than you do? Because love, God loves you more than you understand. I meet so many Christians who don't love themselves. They don't love themselves. You know why? Listen to me. And you can change this today right here. You've listened to the world tell you who you are rather than listen to who God. You're still listening to where you've been, tra you've been rescued from. You're still listening to the voices from which you've been rescued. Now you're over here in the beloved kingdom and you're still listening to the voices of what you've been rescued. You're still li listening to the slave market people tell you that you're not worthy. Oh, well, you've done such and such. Listen, I don't care what you were over here. All that, you got a line through it? Wait, have you got a line through it? Did you put a line through it or didn't you? Then, listen, live the reality. You're living a lie. You've been deceived by the devil to tell you this who you are. When that's not who you are, this is who you are. This is actually who you are. See, you don't see. I want you to see. Listen, with, your, with the eyes of your... I want you to see Ephesians 1.18. I want you to see... I, shut your eyes. Everybody shut your eyes. I want you to see in your inner eyes of your heart. I want you to see with the inner eyes of your heart that you're the most cherished, loved person ever in the world. I want you to see yourself under the principle of 1 John 3, 1. I want you to see how great a love God has bestowed on you. To do that, I want you to see the cross. For it was the cross that brought you to a place where you could become something that you weren't and give up who you were. I am no longer this person. Can you see how great a love the father had when he sent his son to rescue you from the person you was and is willing to make you the person you always wanted to be? He will do so much more than that for you. When the writer says, see how great a love the father has bestowed on us, Listen, Romans 5.5 5 says that at the point of believing the gospel, the Holy Spirit was poured out into our hearts, the love of God. The love of God was poured out into our hearts when we got saved. Embrace that. Look to the cross and see that. Do you see how great a love the Father bestowed on us in that he sent his, Christ, he sent his son to die for us? And... Listen, he rescued you from the person you was in order for you to become the person that he wants you to be. And that's the person you want to be. Okay, look back up. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Watch this now. Watch this. Here's another status privilege. Listen to what he says. Here's what he wants you to see. Out of the love that he has for you to rescue you and transfer you. Listen to what he says. That we... See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. Do you see how great a love? What was the great love that he sent his son? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you see how great a love? Listen, every time the devil tells you that you're not worthy, and you listen to him, you shut that voice down. You shut it down in your soul. You look to the cross. You look to the cross of Jesus Christ. And there you see, do you see how great a love the Father has for you? That through the cross of Jesus Christ, you are forever known by God as a child of his. 
Do you not see that? Every time you get down on yourself, that's that old, old stuff in you. Listen, go to the cross. Take a look at who died there for you. Do you see how great a love? Man, if you can't see the love the Father had for you when he put his son on the cross and died for all the sins of the humanity and transferred you in the kingdom and what he's given you in the transfer is unbelievable. Just the 20 status privileges that you have in salvation would be enough to... I'd carry that thing around with me all the time and every time I began to think that I was a slug or I was a worm in this world, I'd pull that list out and say, that's a lie because this is who I am in Christ. Do you see, do you see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God? And such we are. I thank God every day. I thank God every day of my life for that, for that, for that understanding. I thank him that that great love that God had for me resulted in him being my father and, his, and, and, and me his child. And such we are. For this reason, the world doesn't know us because it did not know him. Finally. Now watch this. It's a real big one. Four is big. God's invitation call into grace salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen to me, is irrevocable. It's irrevocable. Irrevocable. <laughs> it's a big, long word in the Greek, has an alpha privative on the front of it, and a preposition, and then the word. I wrote it on your paper for you. It's a triple, comp it's a triple word in there. A, alpha privative, M E A. And then the Greek word. When you put that much in it, it's really emph emphasized. And the A means without. Here's what it means. It means without regret, irrevocable in the Greek language, means without regret or without change of purpose or not possible to revoke. Not possible. Not possible. It's irrevocable, not possible. Don't listen. Half the church says, oh, yeah, you can lose it. That's not the half I pastor. Listen to this, Romans eleven twenty nine, For the gifts and the calling are irrevocable. Your calling, your calling is irrevocable once you went RSVP, faith in the gospel. Irrevocable. Irrevocable. <laughs> irrevocable. In other words, once called into salvation means always called because of the character of God, not the character of man. I.e., 1 Corinthians 119, or 1 9, God is faithful through whom you were called in fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. How did that happen? John 14, 6. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Oh, my. Don't you love that? Will bring it to pass. <laughs> I love that. Oh, listen. God, what he promises, he'll bring it to pass. He'll bring it to pass. Therefore, your assurance... To one hope of your calling comes from cycling this doctrine I'm giving you today by the faith, the faith cycle. I inhale, exhale it. And every time somebody lies to you, you go to the Word of God and goes like, nope. You got to see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Now listen to lies, not even the ones you tell yourself. Go to the Word of God, let the truth combat lies. To this end also we pray for you always, Paul wrote, that our God will count 
you worthy. Isn't that interesting? God will count you worthy. God will count you, consider you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And for those who are suffering or will be suffering, I give you a closing note. After you have suffered undeservedly for a while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perf perfect, confirm, perfect conf confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Therefore, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Boy, we've done a lot today, people. What you do with it now. God has certainly sent the invitation out for you about the idea of calling. And you need to really respond to it. We've given you a lot of information today. You need to assimilate it by the face cycle. Inhale, exhale, business. Don't listen to lies, not even the ones you tell yourself. They're not true. The word of God is truth. The veracity of God is written for you so that that veracity of truth can become part of your soul dynamics and integrity. And so, our Father, we thank you. We pray for the offering we're about to take, Father, and thank you for your grace that provides every bit of it. And we're so thankful for it, for the generosity of our people. We pray this month, Father, as we begin August as our missionary month offering, our people would be in prayer about it. It's not the amount, it's the attitude of the heart. Whatever bit we can send is an enormous part of a great world ministry to our foreign missionaries, four of them that have put their boots on foreign soil for the uh, cause of Christ. And we're thankful to be a part of the Morgans, the Sextons, the Williams, and the Molinars. And we lift them before you, Father, today and pray that we would be a church that would keep that light burning across the world in all these different areas where they are. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.